I, I honestly, and, and, and I get this question, you know, when I do a lot of like school presentations and stuff to, to little kids, they always ask me, well, if you weren't doing architecture, what would you be doing? I don't know. <laughs> That's why I want to keep doing architecture. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hey, this is Enoch, and welcome back to the Business of Architecture, the show for solo architects, where each week I bring you an interview exploring how you can leverage your skills as an architect to make more money so you can forget about paying the bills and focus on creating great architecture. Today is part two of our interview with architects Evan Troxell, Neil Pan, and Cormac Phelan. At the beginning of 2013, Neil, Evan, and Cormac started a candid, behind-the-scenes and wittily entertaining podcast titled Archispeak, the podcast that dares to peek under the architectural kimono. Now, from the Archispeak Twitter page, Archispeak is defined as large, made-up words that architects and designers use to make themselves sound smarter than you. So without further ado, here's our show. So um, real quick, Neil, if there's two, if there's an architect who's starting a site and he has to choose between, or he or she has to choose between two different social media platforms, which ones would you say the ones they want to be on first? Well, I tell you, um, it's an interesting, it's a great question. You know, there's, I have to say, I think Facebook is one place that if you're going to start a page, you know, for your, for your business, be on Facebook. You know, they've got almost a hundred million eyeballs looking at that site uh, virtually every every day or every month. And that's where there's there's a lot of people. Twitter, there's it's another beast, but there's a lot of action happening on Twitter as well. And ironically enough, um, I didn't really think much of LinkedIn before or even Google Plus. I mean, they have a, a far smaller audience. Um, but what I found is that a lot of uh, referrals to my site, or commenters even on my site come from LinkedIn and Google Plus. I, I have really been surprised. They have uh, very dedicated communities on LinkedIn, for instance, uh, that uh, you know you can post in in groups uh, or join groups, and uh, very dedicated. And they they really there's a lot of traffic that comes from those sites, and I, that actually kind of surprised me. Interesting. Well, let's just a follow up question to that. Let's talk about. Tra there's traffic and then there's traffic that's ready to buy or at least one of your clients that is ready to buy your services. So I noticed you didn't mention House, but that's one of them. Um, right. which, which out of the five there you mentioned, let's pick two, purely for leads to get work. I think leads to get work you're looking at um, well, uh, probably Facebook and House as well. Uh, Facebook is, is helpful because there's just so many people. Every, everyday people are on Facebook. And they're going to see that. Maybe everyday people aren't on LinkedIn. Um, and then um, House, I, I didn't mention that before, but yes, that, that's an excellent site. And actually, I do have some clients uh, just recently that sent me their idea book. Um, as one of the things I typically tell clients when I first meet them is always clip out pictures or send, you know, save photographs of ideas that, you know, you have for your thinking, that you're thinking of for your design. And now House has almost become this, this perfect magazine, if you will, for an unlimited supply of photo photography and that can be very uh, easily searched uh, for very specific spaces. And so it's a great resource and I highly recommend it to my clients uh, to go and search that. And I've, I haven't seen a lot of traffic come from uh, Hal's, but, um, but it, is, it is helpful to have a presence there as well because there's a lot of homeowners that see that site. Yeah. Now, if I can ma make a suggestion also, House.com actually, I read something recently that, and I've come to this conclusion that it's a good way, it actually helps you educate your clients in the value of design. And that's yes. this, this is, I was talking with someone who, who works over there at House and she was telling me that this is actually an unexpected um, thing that happened when, with House, and that's H-O-U-Z-Z.com, is that people, when they're on that, like if you're an architect and you send people there, to browse for photos that they want to basically model their, their project on, then their taste actually changed. They found that people that frequent house, they actually start liking contemporary architecture. There's a lot of that on house, so I'm not surprised. 
Yeah, I when I yeah. was doing design build with a partner, we had a client who had a beautiful post and beam mid-century modern bones of a house that had been kind of modified over time. And when they came to us, they had a set of drawings from Bob's drafting service, which is a real drafting service. And they were basically going to turn it into a stucco tracked house. And oh, all man. we did was start feeding them Dwell magazine. And this was years ago, but you know, when Dwell first came out and it wasn't packed full of ads, it was, it, w it showed some really nice projects and you know, obviously it still does, but, um, it totally changed their mind. It was the thing where they started to see the quality of light and the indoor outdoor spaces that, that modern architecture kind of triumphs. And we ended up doing that for them. And, and it was all because of looking at those pictures. And so it's the same thing. It's just online now. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to, let's jump over to the offline world really, really quick. And I'm going to target a question at you, Cormac, and at, at Evan. I know you guys are involved in presentations and meeting with clients and that part of the the process. I, I know you are Evan. I'm not sure exactly, Cormac, your specific function, because um, I know there's a lot of different roles in the firm. But because our firm is a smaller firm, <laughs> um, project managers are pretty much the you know soup to nuts kind of uh, project managers. All you know, all hands on deck. We um, lead the you know uh, lead everything from the feasibility studies all the way through construction administration. Um, I particularly am, I don't think I could possibly function in this profession if I wasn't hands-on every day. And so um, nine-tenths of the pro, um, documents that, you know, I present, or at least recently have been presenting are created by my hand. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm in there. Okay, good to know. So the question I have then is what let, let's take it from you're, you're giving a presentation and the client's sitting there. We've all been to these meetings where there's an RFP that's been issued. They're interviewing five architecture firms. You show up. You're part of the interview committee. And so I wanted to ask all three of you for your input on what things have you seen effective for how to carry those out? Because I know a lot of times they're intimidating. It feels like it's a, a dog and pony show. Well, my, my first thing that I would say is the most successful presentations that we've given are um, the ones where we just show how well we work together as a team. And if, if the client who's there, who's interviewing you and they're looking at three or five different firms in that day or over a couple of days, they're tired. If there's any way that you can engage them and, uh, and just show how well your team works together, I found that to be a huge bonus for, for them because if they get, any sense that that the people who are interviewing together number one aren't going to be working on their project um, and then number two that that there's some something between a couple of people that doesn't seem quite right they're they're very dismissive of that kind of behavior I think I definitely agree with Evan um, you know, a lot of times it, it definitely comes down to team chemistry. I mean, you can walk in there with a great, you know, PowerPoint slideshow or, um, you know, good 3D renderings of things and some, you know, boards and stuff like that, that, you know, kind of show the quality of work you can do, but they want to know the quality of the person. They want to know the quality of the team and, you know, pretty pictures are, are great, but, pretty teams are better. Yeah, well, yeah, they're going to be working with you for years, most likely. I mean, and, and so you've got to fit well with them on top of, you know, being a good team what, what that you bring what in What have there. you guys seen about how do you demonstrate that cohesiveness as a team? How would you get that across? Well, I think it's got to be legitimate, and you have to already have the experience of working together quite a bit because I think probably the easiest way to show that is when you fi you finish each other's sentences mid stride because you're so used to working with each other and you know what uh, the other people think and you you know their sensibilities. Um, it's got to be real or else it's it's not going to work. Yeah, that you know, I totally agree. Um, but also, you know, being able to when you outline, um, you know, a lot of times we'll go in and we'll say, you know, the, a, a lot of them will ask us, you know, about our process. And 
to be able to have the entire team basically explain and outline their role in the process and how they're going to fit and you know how, how that seamlessly works between all of the different people um, you know it shows the client that you know they're you've assembled a competent team and that they're getting a competent team. Neil do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I would say um, that this also works on a small scale um, so that you have to create that sort of relationship with the with the potential client and you um, you have to go in there and be friendly show that you know what you're doing and uh, be professional but you know be act friendly because even though this may not be a school project um, that I may be working on uh, that lasts several years uh, like my uh, like my co-hosts do but you know, even with, with a remodel, you're going to be involved with these people pretty heavily for maybe six months to a year. And, you know, I do a lot of work uh, in my neighborhood uh, around town. And so you're going to see those people as well. So you want to have a, a, a good relationship. And, uh, and I think that's, that's one way that, you know, you can, um, if you're friendly and, you, and it's genuine and you're not just trying to scam somebody uh, to get a job, then that works. And so let's let's talk about the visibility factor of the internet because when there's just so many ways, so many things that can be done. You know, you see people going viral all the time. And going along with the, I think the chef analogy, Evan, that you were talking about, you know, sharing and just giving, giving, giving that information online, I've seen to be effective. From you guys' experience, and because you guys are pretty deeply involved in social media and online tools, you know. Can we brainstorm a couple ideas about how maybe three different kinds of architects could benefit from the online space? Let's take, for instance, a sole practitioner, what's something they could do. Um, let's think about uh, a middle management person at a mid-sized firm that wants to reach out and connect with people in their niche. And I don't have a third person. Maybe you guys can think of someone. Well, Cormac, you, you've also been a sole practitioner as well. But uh, yeah. I think from my perspective, the... Uh, just just getting out there and being in, in the public actually helps that. And then to have that online presence is what your clients or potential clients are going to see and hear after you leave their house and, uh, you know, or leave I'm their... I'm going to ask a follow-up uh, question. Yeah, go ahead. So let me, I, I just want to interject, Neil. Um, when you say get out there in the public, you know, um, what... What venues have you found to be most effective for connecting with the kind of people that want to do business with you? Because, I mean, going out in the public, you know, let's be a little bit more specific about that for the people that may be wondering, you know, who do I talk to and who exactly should I go schmooze with? Sure. And it, it's not easy. You have to get out uh, and involved in uh, local events. You'd say your chamber, your local uh, chamber or rotary clubs, a different uh, B&I potential events. Uh, and then also, too, if you've got a local AIA office, that may not help you gain clients, but it'll help you talk with other architects to find out about other venues. Um, home tours is another one. You can go see, um, you know, what other architects are doing for ideas, and then you get a chance to actually meet them and talk to them. And then you can also, what's fun when you go on these home tours is you follow around other people and listen to what they're saying. Um, and you can gain a lot of valuable information by just, uh, you know, opening up your ears and listening to what other people are walking through these home tours are saying and thinking. And that can give you some valuable insight to what you should or how you should maybe approach a potential client in the future. Yeah. I want to turn this to Cormac because you mentioned that Cormac was a sole practitioner for a while. Cormac, it was my understanding um, from what I read, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you had your firm, but the work was just maybe it wasn't there and you ended up taking a full-time job. And Cormac, I'd like to get a little bit of insight on your story and what you learned from those years of being a sole practitioner. Well, um, well, that's a <laughs> get your handkerchiefs out. Um, but, the violin, uh, I'm the violin. <laughs> exactly. No, um, I I had worked for um, a couple of different firms early on, um, honing a lot of uh, my skills in commercial, and had always wanted to do residential. And I had um, some buddies of mine from college who they wanted to basically kind of, you know, go out on our own. And so we did 
and this was in 2005. The market was still good, and we had you know plenty of opportunity out there. We had you know some really good projects. Uh, we had some things, um, some involvement with the new urbanist movement, um, and you know things. We were so kind of inter intertwined with both developments and residential that as that market started to dry up. Um, and I wanted to kind of fall back on commercial. You know, this is 2006, 2007, um, end of 2006, 2007, when we really started to feel things dry up. And um, everybody was going after the same projects. And we were in a smaller market in Florida at the, you know, I was still living in Florida at the time. And it just, they all went away. I mean, the people who had, you know, residential contracts, they got scared, they weren't sure about the market and the economy. So they just, you know, they pulled up stakes and ran. Um, so, you know, we, we looked at what our options were um, in the smaller market that we were at. And, um, you know, some friends took basically, you know, my former partners basically took jobs wherever they could find it. Um, I am so, I, I honestly, and, and, and I get this question, you know, when I do a lot of like school presentations and stuff to, to little kids, they always ask me, well, if you weren't doing architecture, what would you be doing? I don't know. <laughs> That's why I want to keep doing architecture. And so um, I, I started looking around and found that the DC market was, seemed to be um, insulated. Uh, there was a lot of uh, work going on up here and a lot of opportunity. So not knowing anybody, we, you know, picked up stakes, moved away from family and moved to DC. Uh, have had wonderful opportunities to do all sorts of um, interesting projects, historic preservation, uh, new projects, a lot of additions. And, you know, when I came in, you know, in, I was the new guy, they were like, well, let's give him all the Band-Aid work. Um, so it was doing a lot of like, you know, fixing, you know, pre-existing problems. Um, and, and so, you know, and that's kind of what led me to where I'm at now is kind of going back and, you know, I, I jokingly say working for the man, but no, it's, it's actually working for the opportunity to do, as we always say, good work, you know, I don't, I'm not quite sure what the, the follow up to that one was, but that was the backstory. <laughs> That's, that's a good backstory. Well, I guess, do you guys, from what you're seeing, and I'm going to address this to Cormac and to Neil, uh, right, we're about to wrap up, but, you know, is it really sustainable to be a sole practitioner nowadays? Can, can it be done reasonably? And let's say, let's say with a sole wage earner, is it realistic to venture out? And is it sustainable? I would say from my experience, um, in, in, in Neil's is, is, is an interesting story in its, in its own right because, you know, he's, a, he's in a family of two architects, one as a, a residential architect and one as a commercial architect. And, and so it's, it's, it's a really, I actually admire Neil's story because, uh, you know, one architect is hard to live with, but, you know, two, wow. But, um, you know, honestly, um, soul practicing is hard, um, especially if you're, you know, in larger markets where there's a lot of people, you know, basically going after the same thing. But in smaller markets where you can do, as Neil was talking about, the personalized business, I think there's still very strong opportunities to do sole practitioner. Um, some of the most, you know, fantastic work that's been done throughout, you know, our, you know, short architectural history has been done by sole practitioners that, use this as an opportunity to guide the clients um, in their vision, you know, not just, you know, be the, you know, kind of uh, button down stiff architect that, you know, people seem to, you know, think we all are and fear um, about that, you know, oh, I can't work with them because they're just going to tell me exactly what I want and, and they don't really work with me. No, I, I think sole practitioner is the ones who kind of break that mold and show everybody that, you know, hey, we're, um, you know, we're a family man too. We're, you know, we can work with you and listen to you and, and really it, that's kind of, you know, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to cut myself off, but yeah, I, I honestly think that that's, um, that there still are opportunities for us. I would say 
as Enoch, you, as you found several of the people that you've interviewed, that many of them um, have had success, and some of that success has come from developing their own projects. Um, and so I think that is certainly an avenue, although some, you, know, you have to have some capital to do that or find some clever ways to get that capital to do that, and then there's a lot of risk involved. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I would, I would have to say if you were going to, you know, if you had a family, if you were, let me, let me rephrase that. If you're kind of on your own and you've got a little bit of savings, I think you can, you can try and make a go at it. Um, you don't have a lot to lose. If you've got a family and a mortgage, um, I'd say that's a pretty dangerous thing to do. A lot of us that are in the sole practitioner, um, you know, venue right now are doing it out of uh, no other choice. Um, there were no other jobs the last four or five years. And so we're trying to, you know, find and make a living. Um, you know, if, as Cormac said, my wife's also an architect. Um, she's been able to stay employed um, and that's given us some benefits that, you know, I wouldn't have had, we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and it's kept us in our home and, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, if you, if you are interested in getting out there, you know, listen to some of your previous podcasts about how some of the others, other people out there have done it. And then, you know, um, get out there and, and try it, but you really kind of need to have that safety net uh, to do so uh, because it's going to be tough. And I think uh, I'm forgetting now who it was you might've interviewed, um, but they, you know, it said that it took them several years before they started to become profitable. And yeah, that's right. not uncommon in any business. And it's not uncommon in, in architecture as well. Okay, great. Well, that's a great place to end it. And I just want to point out uh, my buddy Mark LePage over Entrepreneur Architect has resources also for small and solo practitioners to help them uh, run a better business. And now is basically the shameless plug part. So I just want to let everyone know, you know, on Business of Architecture, you can go to find information about how to launch a Facebook page, how to run ad campaigns, and all sorts of information about what's really effective for generating the kind of uh, clients that will help you automate sort of a sales system with the internet. And then let's switch over and give the plug for uh, Arches Speak, of course. And I love, man, I love listening to these guys. Their, their tagline here, they have wit and humor. Um, the tagline is, um, what is it? Arches Speak is made up words that make uh, seem smarter than you are. Yeah. <laughs> Some, exactly. Something like that. I think that's that's on Twitter. That's your tag. And then at the beginning of every episode, they say something to the effect of, Archer Speak is a show that dares to peek under the architectural kimono, which is, of course, uh, letting everyone know what really happens in architecture. So, yeah. gentlemen, tell us where can we find out more about Archer Speak and get dialed in to what you guys are doing there. Uh, probably the best way is on our website, arcaspeakpodcast.com. Uh, and you can also find us uh, at Twitter or interact with us there um, at Arcaspeak, which is SP, uh, abbreviated SPK at the end. Uh, and then we also have a Facebook page. And we do encourage people to either use the website or the Facebook page to interact with us. Let us know what you're thinking, problems you're having, ideas uh, that you'd like to hear us talk about. Sure, and they can find you on iTunes, right? If they subscribe on iTunes, it'll be automatically downloaded to their phone. That's yes. right. And yes. you guys also, if someone has an Android phone, how do they get the podcast delivered? Uh, you can go right to our page, and you can download it on there, or you can also find us on Stitcher Radio now. That's one of the new things that we've come out on. So if you download that app, I think that's on Android and iPhone. Excellent. Neil, Evan, and Cormac, um, thank you guys for what you do. Thanks for being on the show. And I'm sure this won't be the last time that we'll be able to have you guys on. Thanks for having right. us. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank okay. you. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that puts the lid on another show about the business of architecture. I really hope that you got something out of this show that can help you have more success and profit in the world of architecture. And if you want to join the discussion about this episode, you can find it on the podcast page on businessofarchitecture.com. And while you're there, feel free to share the show using the social media share links. If you sign up for the Business of Architecture Insider List, I'll send you other resources like the Architect Marketing Guide and information on how to use web tools to get more visibility for your firm and your work.
views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, guarantee, promise, agreement, affirmation, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, commitment, except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.